on the stream week. So we'll be back on Sunday after today. You guys ready to get into this uh, gameplay trailer or what? Oh, it's in 4K. Let's go. Even though you guys won't be seeing it, I will be. <laughs> Sorry about it. Sorry about it. Let's get gaby. There's the gameplay. <laughs> Hi everybody and welcome to this first glimpse at the gameplay of Dune Awakening. I'm really excited to welcome you into our world, but I want to point out a couple of things. Yes. First of all, this is a beta. Yes. This is beta footage. Yes. So you'll see bugs and you'll see yes! polish still. Sorry. And secondly, our tutorialization is still a work in progress. With that said, let's get into it. The start of the game, Dune Awakening, begins off-world on this large spaceship. Show yourself, child. It is here, in the presence of the Reverend Mother, the character creation begins. Now the first thing you'll do Bald. is choose your preset avatar. Ah, that's me right there. That, Some of these are heavily that inspired bar down my head. by the Denis Villeneuve movies. Oh wow. Once you've chosen a base visual look, you can then move into the depths of character creation and make choices about how your character feels, both in terms of age, but also a plethora of physical attributes. Oh, well, it's gone now. Our goal in giving players access to a detailed character creation oh, I saw Glod. is to really allow them to create I saw Glod the avatar eyes. that lets them fulfill their fantasy of living out their dreams on Arrakis. Glod eyes. The music. There are a multitude of hairstyles. Hello? The music, dude. and other things such as tattoos for players oh, to choose from. Yep, all over my body. You can even choose different styles of lipstick and eyeshadow. My character will be fucked up looking because we're, we're aligning ourselves with the Harkonnen. Everyone's doing House Atreides, we know that. We gotta kill them all. A metallic lipstick, glod everywhere. Bit of Ligro? You can choose the That's muscle cool. tone of your character from height, arm thickness, leg thickness, neck length. The tallest neck possible. Just giraffe and your once character. Once you finish your character, you choose your name and enter the world. How long is my name? And once you've customized the avatar that you want to play Ooh, in, the game, I made it. Well, then we move into the second phase of character creation. Then I will sift your words for lies. Let's begin. Where were you born? The second phase of character creation a world of is where water, you, as a person who may or may not know anything about Dune, get to make choices about who you were before the game starts. Ah, familiar! Where you come from, what caste you belong to in the Dune universe, and of course, perhaps most importantly, who your mentor was. Who was your mentor? Your mentor determines your starting set of skills when you enter the game. Hmm. You must have been very young. The mind must be prepared or the training does not take. The test is almost complete. Have you spoken truths? Come here. Kneel. Put your hand in the box. Hold at your neck the Gonja Bar, the high-handed enemy. Don't pull away or you will die. Great plots are afoot in the Imperium, and the currents of intrigue run deeply. Um, if you haven't watched Dune, go watch Dune. Uh, this won't make sense to you at all, if you haven't. Also, there is a... Um, I forgot what the Dune show is called in November. It's all about Bene Gesserit and how they kind of like put their roots everywhere across the universe. It's going to be a sick show. HBO. HBO? Yeah, that's on HBO. So that's November. You should go check it out. Arrakis is the key and the Fremen 
The Fremen are missing. Prophecy, there you go. You will go to Arrakis as our agent prisoner. You have one task. Have you spoken to the Fremen? Wake the sleeper. You will know when it is done. Now we're going to jump ahead a little bit in the story here, uh, skipping past several events just to sort of get uh, into the early new player experience of the game. And you'll see that the player, after various shenanigans, wakes up here in a cave. And as we sort of look around the cave, we'll notice that it's filled with Fremen and uh, the remnants of, you know, this ancient culture. Does he not have a script that he's reading from? <laughs> in a cave! <laughs> so now as the player takes their first steps in the world, they're really here amongst the dead. And so the first question they should be asking is, what happened here? Who are That's these people? Does they a treaty salute? Vest, vest, boots, a treaty salute. Oh, it's an emote. And so the first question they should be asking is, what happened here? Who are these people? And, you know, this is just a place where we give players a little bit of time to adjust their settings, get a feel for the movement keys, and then move forward into the cave. And they'll stumble upon their first major interaction point, which Back is the Frem Kit. Frem Kit. The Frem Kit in our game serves as both a, a backpack for the player, of course, but also really a guide. Um, the Fremen used to pack these. Salvage handheld something, uh, vest. With interesting objects that they could use to survive in the desert and it's no different from the player. So here they begin their first crafting experience, crafting a small scrap knife out of metal that was in the Frem kit. These caves have been moisture sealed uh, in order to preserve the moisture of those within the cave. And so the player, as they explore, will be able to use their scrap metal knife to pierce the seals and escape. So really this entire area, built using Unreal Engine 5, is just to sort of get the player and ease them into the path. A lot of survival games have very abrupt, very harsh beginnings. And we tried to, you know, make the experience of joining June Awakening just a little easier. Just give people a little bit of a feel for the world before we really toss them out into the harshness that is the desert of Arrakis. So here we've crafted a heal kit and we're going to use that to heal our character. And once we're healed, you'll see that our stamina bar in the bottom left appears. It's here. And now that we have stamina, we can climb. It's just a red bar. And the a climbing system in June Awakening is based in part it's a red bar and a green bar on the one that we built for Conan Exiles. It's a free form climbing system. It can be used to climb almost anywhere. And as you'll see later, the new uh, technology in. available in Dune Awakening, such as suspensor belts, allows us to do even more interesting things with traversal. Yeah, suspensor belts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Little anti-grav belts. Those are cool. So once we finish that first little section, we're jumping ahead. We're going straight into the harsh real world of Arrakis. And here are your first steps on Arrakis. Your ornithopter has crashed and you've got to escape from the crash site immediately because the sandworm always comes. And what you have to keep in mind is these are the little ones. So these are the first sandworms you encounter in the game. There's bigger ones later on. The other thing that you have to pay attention to as a player is sunstroke. Right there. Right in the middle below right there. You have sun exposure at the top. You've got this worm. No, I'm assuming the noise that you're making right there. And then your hydration is right here. Well, yoink. I like the UI. It's clean. What up, Amaro? Stroke and heat. So if you see in the top middle of the UI here, we've got this sunstroke bar building up. The longer you stay in the sunlight, the more chance you have of getting into the sunstroke. Our player here, not the sharpest knife in the drawer, has decided to stay in the sun and try harvesting water from plants. So he has become sunstroked. 
Sunstroke gives you a debuff. I mean, sun is stroking things out here. Damn. Means that your water goes down much faster than it normally dog. would. That means you'll need to drink more often. So stick to the shadows. Avoid the sun. It will eventually wear off if you stay in shade long enough. So now that we've made our way out of the first part of the desert and we're heading deeper in, we're going to start to harvest in the game world. So harvesting in a lot of these survival games is quite similar. In this, this case, is cool. we're picking up items, but we're about to pull out what's known as the cut array. And what we do with the cut array is we analyze structures to find their weak points. And then we cut along those lines to Dude, break open the structures this and is gain cool. the resources inside. This is like mining. We uh, we apply it both to rocks, we apply it to metals in the game world. And at the start of the game as a player, you'll just be scrounging around, picking up, you know, finding structural weak points in rocks that you can harvest, breaking them apart, and taking those pieces with you. Way to make something so monotonous and just like, you know, any survival game you play, you're going to have to collect something. Now you're kind of just like tracing things. Like it's a little bit more interactive. It's a, it's a bit, it's fun. Spice withdrawal, huh? Sunstroke, spice withdrawal. Now we've jumped ahead a little bit. Yeah, kind of like Subnautica. That the player is starting to be affected by the spice in the air. And this means that players need to get somewhere safe in shelter before the spice overwhelms them and overwhelms their senses. And this is a, another large part of the game. We're not going to show too much of it today. But spice is a very important part. Yeah. With the world broken apart by the War of Assassins, there are NPC bases scattered all over Arrakis. That suit is pretty We're cool. We're switching to a different character now. One who's slightly more advanced, and he's using his binoculars to mark an NPC outpost. We're going to mark that. That marker will then appear on our compass. And you're able to approach them in any way you like. In this case, oh. our character oh. Oh. Oh uses a shiga wire claw combined with a suspensor belt the suspensor to belt high ground is so and approach sick. the enemy base from above kind of one of the interesting things about dune awakening is just how you can combine the different abilities and this is how traversal really plays into the game like you end up being able to attack these bases from any angle that you'd like now our player is going to craft the first gun in the game known as a mauler pistol which translates to you know the basic kind of weapon in the game as you may know in dune Bullets are not the preferred type of ammunition. Instead, it's darts, which are fired at a slower rate in order to try and attempt to pierce shields. Now, this early in the game, enemies don't really have shields. So the player is going to sneak into the base from above and use a combination of their early abilities. In this case, dropping out a grenade, then sneaking around the corner and beginning to get into NPCs head on. Now, troopers are the basic shock troops of the universe. And their ability trees reflect that. Grenades, shiga wire claws for moving around, and of course, they're able to take down people with headshots. You can see how suspensor belts uh, really allow you to change your approach to There's combat. a lot of movement. June Awakening is at heart a third person shooter with melee and abilities. And it's the combination of melee oh, abilities, that movement. and range shooting that creates what we call Man, that's combined nice. arms in the game. The movement in this game is cool. Now we've taken a fair bit of damage. In animation looks rough, but I'm assuming that is not a final movement uh, animation at all in this battle. I'd be surprised if it was. We're going to stop for a second to heal ourselves up with a bandage. Bandages heal over time, so you can't just heal yourself to 100%. You have to actually get into safety, get behind cover before you start using them. Now we're going to quickly switch to a slightly different character to show off more of the melee. Yeah, that we have in the game. that's me. You're about to see that when a character gets in close, it's melee time. Yeah, baby. Let's go. This character has sword master abilities. First of all, the knee charge, which is about getting in close to do damage in combat, and then quickly setting up to a repost, which allows you to parry and oh. return massive amounts of damage to your enemy. Oh. Of course, later in the game, when enemies have shields. Melee is a much more emphasized style of combat. And you see that when a player is not really equipped to handle ranged characters, they have to fall back on their abilities to get in close. That knee now, charge is kind of cool. <laughs> we switch again. Now we're going to switch to a set of Mentat abilities. One of these abilities is known as Battlefield Calculation. Using Battlefield Calculation, the Mentat is able to calculate from anybody that they see what they're carrying and what they're wearing. Now we've dropped out our Hunter Seeker. 
Eggman Swing Set, what up? Uh, thanks for the raid over on Twitch. We're checking out the Dune Awakening gameplay real quick that came out earlier today. So we're going to be playing some Once Human here shortly. But this is what we're doing. And we're using our Hunter Seeker ability to take down enemies in the world really quickly. You hear that? Now, obviously, when you're playing with a friend, you want to combine your abilities and work together. In this case, the Mentat's able to point out to their friend where people are in the world and how much ammo and stuff they have. And you'll see that when enemies go down sometimes, they go into- Planet Mans! I haven't done Planet Side in a long time. Um, the Mentat stuff is really cool. To a down but not out state, it's up to you whether you execute them oh. or continue to fight. Oh. After a quick reload, it's back into the battle with our friend coming from above and throwing out one more grenade. Entats can get so much information off of anybody in the battlefield immediately. And that is so cool. I really like that. That is odd. That's, that's really cool. And once you've defeated your enemies in battle, Sometimes, you just gotta take their blood. Yep. That makes sense. Blood In order sack. to get water, the player's going to ha have to craft themselves this blood sack and this blood extractor and use it to harvest blood from their fallen enemies. Now, in, in our game, it's not always a good thing to just take blood from people. It's potentially bad and can only be used for certain things. Once you've extracted the blood, you can then, of course, drink it, as you'll see here, in their blood bag. But when they do that, it causes a debuff, because the blood is not exactly pure, and drinking blood for water is not exactly a one-to-one -one scenario. So you'll see that our health bar got shorter, while our water bar went up. And so being a blood drinker is not always looked upon in the right way. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Of course, once you've played the game for a little while... The environment is A+, plus, by the way the sounds from like the wind and everything, the dust that's blowing. You'll start wanting to build your own base. And the first part of that is placing down what we call a sub fief console. A sub fief console allows you to claim a small part of Arrakis as your own, but it does in turn mean that you'll start to owe taxes to the emperor. So here we are with our- Very similar to system. once human. And you can see that we have two types of building here. We have the holograms, which show in the beginning. I call them Solido projections internally. And we have the way that you fill in, which is by holding down the mouse button in this case. So yep. the cool thing about this is it allows us to have this cooperative building system. Yup. I like the blueprint system. So you'll see that one player places out the Salido projections and the other player fills them in with the materials from their inventory. This is just a way that lets people play together and build together in an interesting and exciting way. You see that ship right there, dude? What? Play together and build together. And an that's actually moving too. Way. That Arakeen over there. We've seen through our experience with Conan Exiles is that some people just love to build in these games. Uh, so yeah. we've created a system called the Blueprint Building System that allows players to save a copy of their base as one of these giant holographics. Yep. Then they can take them out into the world and place them out wherever they like and then rebuild. Or you can make the blueprints and then you can sell them on the market to make money as being an architect, which I learned, which is also really cool. Big Star Wars Galaxies vibes. There's a lot of player-driven economy stuff in this game from what I've read and what I've understood. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we have another system in the game which allows you to take these, you know, big architectural designs of your buildings there and you sell them to other players on the exchange. I should have just waited. <laughs> Once again, this is a way to quickly move your base around the world. If you've got a design you like, you don't have to you know, throw it out immediately. And it allows you to create these interesting masterpieces. It also, as you can see here, allows you to, you know, if you're not artistically minded and you don't like building big bases, you can buy them from other players. Really cool. Once you finish crafting a base, you want to fill it with all kinds of machines, fabricators, and refineries. And of course, hearkening back 
to the blood extraction we just did, we've got the blood purifier. So what we want to do is take the blood from our blood sack and deposit it into the blood purifier. Being able to build as a group of people and then like collect all of our resources and into like um, chests or wherever they're holding stuff would be is gonna be really fun. That's that's gonna be a lot of cool, a lot of cool, um, a lot of cool stuff coming from that kind of gameplay. Time, it will refine into lovely fresh water, which can then extract into our leader johns and carry with us out into the desert. While there's many varieties or fabricators that you can use to craft things in the game. One of the most exciting things is crafting yourself a vehicle. Yes. So we're opening the technology menu and from here we're able to purchase the design for a sand bike. A sand bike is one of the early vehicles available to players in the game and you can kit it out with different types of modules including an extra seat which allows you to bring your friends with you. So in this menu you can see we're fabricating ourselves a sandbike. And all the different parts of the sandbike have to be fabricated individually. Nice. So the player is going to the menu here, they're crafting different things which will make up their sandbike. A fabricator and animation. See, it prints out in this kind of 3D printer type way. It's sick. Where all the materials are turned into these particles which then come together to form the different pieces of the sandbike. And you can see it's sort of all happening in the background here. And if we go out into the world view, you can actually see the pieces forming up inside the fabricator so a base with lots of these fabricators going is actually pretty cool and pretty busy wow once we've done we jump back in the artistic design and keeping it very um cohesive to the cinematic universe um they did an outstanding job and i knew that that that's what they were trying to do is like keep it very grounded like just like the cinematic universe they have and so far yep and we pull things out of the queue chuck them into our inventory and then we use the welding tool to place out vehicle pieces. Now again, oh. this is a cooperative activity. We've thought about multiplayer. So any other player could be working with you to place modules and pieces of this bike. And so we're going to assemble this bike. But oh. of course, when you work on larger vehicles oh. and your friends are with you, you'll be able to work together to craft big things like transport ornithopters or sand crawlers. And so we're gonna add the body to this. And we're going to add an extra seat just in case we want to bring our friend with us out into the world. Man. Once the bike's been assembled and fueled up, you jump on and you can head out to explore the greater areas of Arrakis. Even the sound of that thing sounded cool. Heading out into the world to explore can um, be a dangerous experience. Yeah, that's not good for that and guy. As you explore the universe, you'll find certain dynamic events will occur. In this case, a war of assassins has claimed a new victim, a oh, ship dude. which falls from the sky, spilling its loot all over the sand. Look so at we the, head out there. Look at the trails that the bike is leaving and then kicking up dust behind it. To see what we can get, to harvest and gather as much as we can. Oh, dude. Of there's... course, the problem is this is extremely visible to everybody in the nearby area. So yep. people will be able to see this. And so... In a PvP area, you might f suddenly find yourself coming into competition with other players. In a PvE area, you might just find other people competing with you to get to the loot first. And you get to battle the sun on top of that. Oh, dude. Oh my god. Just and like of course, looting. at night time, there are different kinds of threats. Because while the heat of the day is dangerous, uh... at night, the Sardaukar patrol this area of the desert with huge spotlights, searching for players. Now this player is over here, harvesting dew with a dew reaper, sucking the water off the surface of these plants. And they've been captured and seen by the Sardaukar. Uh, and oh. the Sardaukar send down troops who come floating down out of the sky Dude. to attack and destroy the players. Watch out. Now, of course, as mentioned, traveling on the surface at any time risks drawing a sandworm. Yeah, you're making but a ton of noise. Which we've created to draw players out of their comfort zones. So in this case, there's a special type of sand here on the surface known as flower sand. Flower sand, according to the books, is the softest kind of sand. And players can use it to refine it into a variety of different materials that they need for crafting. So 
You want to come out into the desert and you want to try and find flower sand. But you have to be wary and pay attention because as you harvest, you risk drawing the attention of the sandworm. We've awoken the beast. The sandworm is coming. We spent too much time out here and it's coming to get us. Now you can see in the middle of the screen the indicator showing us that the sandworm is angry and it's coming after us. And our only option now is to Always get back to rocky ground. Chasing or the you. Gonna take us. I don't know how those guys survived that, but somehow they managed to get to the safety of the rock island. Once you've crafted your first ornithopter, you'll be able to take to the air and your entire perspective of the world shifts. From here, it'll make traversing the world a lot safer because you can avoid the sandworms. It'll also help you to go out into the larger world of Arrakis. Here we are in the Dude, This game's gonna be fucking stupid fun. We're going to make fun. our way south. What until the we heck? find the place known as Harko Village. Harko Village is the current seat of the Harkonnen after their city, Carthag, was destroyed in a nuclear explosion during the War of Assassins. There's more details like that in the lore of the game for players to discover and explore. So we're going to land at Harko. And we're oh, going that to explore the social space. I thought that was a loading screen. It was, I don't think it was. Once you arrive in Harko Village, you'll be able to meet up with other players, interact with them, trade look at this cape give me all the capes dude and create guilds the game has a variety of social interaction mechanics from emotes to grouping to a chat throughout harko village you'll also interact with story characters follow the main story the universe is incredible like this the lighting and everything that's happening and the sounds You'll be able to meet vendors who will sell you exotic items. They let you live. That is interesting. You'll be able to get a feel for how the factions are viewed in the world. And of course, you'll be able to swear allegiance to one of the major factions, the Harkonnen or the Atreides. Swear your guild's allegiance and begin to take parts in the politics of the Imperium. Once you've grouped up with friends, you should go out into the world and find desert imperial testing stations. These are dungeon-like experiences, which you and your friends can work through together. So here we are landing our various ornithopters outside of one of the desert testing stations. The wings fall in and, and everything. In as a group. Now it's really important to prepare different skills and abilities. These areas tend to be more of a challenge and it's great to work together to complement each other. So this is the skill tree. Here you can equip different types of abilities and techniques. We have three slots for abilities and three slots for techniques. And there are multiple different trees depending on the type of trainers that you've interacted with in the world. So our character- The trainer system is very similar to what galaxies used to do way back in the day in pre-CU. Character here is going to equip a series wow. of abilities that complements the rest of their group. In this case, Swordmaster Techniques. All right, so we're heading in. Uh, that me. And of course, you can use suspensor belts to traverse, as you'd expect. And we're going to explore this Imperial Testing Lab. Oh, I love that, You've dude. entered Desert Botanical Testing Station number 163. I'm Dr. Wen Olmeka, Senior Plant Geneticist here at the station. Testing stations have storylines as well as enemies to fight and loot to be found. So you really want to go in here and enjoy the experience. Playing through with friends, working together, using different weapons and trying out different techniques. Oh, dude. Bailey looks so sick. This player has placed out a portable cover. It's a different ability to what we've seen before. The you shields. see that the enemies here have shields. Oh, it the flame slows throw. them it's down. Easy to get through a shield because you can burn the air around them.
And of course our characters are a little higher level than they were in the start of this video. So you're able to see that, uh, yeah, we can take people down a little more easily. And of course when you get to the end of these areas you find these really cool loot chests. And in these loot chests you find specialized components that are used for crafting exotic weapons and items. The end game of Dune Awakening takes place in the deep. Yeah, this is Dune. What up, Tech? Giant Good to see you, man. Spice blows will happen, drawing players from all around to try and harvest the spice as quickly as possible. You want to get there first, and you want to try and take as much spice as you can before an enemy guild shows up to try and take it away from you. Now, of course, if you're clever and you start to lose the battle, you might place out a thumper. And that limits the time in which people are able to take spice because then the big worm is going to show up. I hope you've enjoyed this brief glimpse at the gameplay of Dune Awakening and we're really excited to have you join us when the game releases. Well, everything I just saw just uh, makes me want to play it now. And I'm jealous that I know a couple people that have been playing it for a couple months now. And I'm sad that I'm not one of them. Everything I watched was like, yep, that's pretty much what I want to be doing. <laughs> yeah, Shai Halud, man. He's huge. Obviously. All right, let's actually play some.